But I'm thrilled to invite our last two speakers. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, our next speaker, who is a news applications developer at uh, one of the most amazing and highly esteemed uh, investigative journalism organizations in the world, ProPublica, uh, where she makes interactive graphics and data visualization. Uh, she also teaches a design course at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. And before joining ProPublica, she wrote for Scientific American and Wired on a variety of topics uh, around science and health. Um, so please help me welcome Lena Groger. Thanks, Irene, and, and hi, everyone. So I know the Museum of Science gets a lot of attention, and I'm sure we all had a lot of fun there last night. Um, but we're actually right around the corner from another great museum. Uh, if I can show you the map, uh, MIT Museum. And I definitely recommend, now it's a little bit, bit late, but I recommend you check it out if you ever get the chance. And the MIT Museum is filled with exhibits on robots. It's got holograms and slow motion photos. Um, but it also chronicles an important part of Canterburyian history, the MIT hacks. And now I grew up in Cambridge, and almost every year we'd end up hearing stories about the, these MIT pranks and practical jokes put on by the students, which I guess are sort of the inevitable outcome of a school full of genius engineers. Um, but they range from famously putting a police car up on the top of the MIT dome, which you can actually see at the museum. It was fake. Uh, or making the tallest building in Cambridge a giant uh, game of Tetris, which was actually controllable from a joystick attached to a podium nearby. Uh, if you've ever walked over the Mass Ave Bridge and noticed these like odd markings on the sidewalk, those are smoots, uh, which mark off the distance of the whole bridge in the height of Oliver Smoot, who lay down end over end in 1958. And even now, every MIT student knows that the length of the bridge is 364.4 smoots and one ear. <laughs> but one of these hacks began as a search. And if you'd been walking around campus on December 16th, 2006, you might have noticed something a little bit off with the letters on the MIT admissions building. Students at the time began to spot posters appearing along the wall of the Infinite Corridor. And this went on and on until finally, you might be able to guess what happens here, they found Waldo. And he turned out to be larger than life on the side of the Stata Center. I know it's cute. Uh, but typically, our childhood searches for Waldo don't lead us to a nine-story building. Um, they stay pretty small. And Waldo is typically a tiny person in the middle of a lot of other tiny things. Uh, and that's what makes him so hard to find. And that's what I want to spend some time today on, we things. How we read them, why they're useful, what principles we can apply to make them work for us. And um, I think in many ways, uh, Waldo and the search for Waldo can tell us quite a lot um, about the subject. Uh, so in the last talk, we had the Flaneur, and now you're getting Waldo. Uh, and Waldo is sort of the anti-hero of, of we things, at least when they apply to, to data visualization or graphics. Uh, in a lot of these cases, Waldo can basically be a pretty good example of what not to do um, when you use we things in, in your own work. So what do I mean by we thing? Um, probably the most immediate definition uh, are, are things that are physically small. So they're little things on the page. And we see them all the, the time in, in news graphics, and we're probably pretty familiar with, with some of these forms. Um, so we've got small multiples, and spark lines, and icons, et cetera. And I'll go into details about, about all of these. And these visual forms work for many reasons, um, but one is that they let you make comparisons. Um, we'll start with tiny sequences of, of graphics, also known as small multiples. And these are so successful because we don't have to rely on memory, right? Every bit of information uh, is in front of you at the same time. So we can easily see changes or patterns or differences. Um, here it's planets, but we've also got first lady hairstyles or food trucks or dressing appropriately for different climates or the distribution of deaths in the 1870s or fashion color trends, or telegraph signals, or highway safety, or clocks around the world, or bird wingspan, or last but not least, Bill Murray's hats. <laughs> and the reason we can make comparisons so easily uh, is because these small multiples take advantage of the built-in capabilities of our visual, sum our visual system. And this is something that Rob mentioned. Um, it's called pre-attentive processing. Uh, and whether it's color or shape or size, we can tell immediately when, when something is different without really having to, to focus on it. So technically, pre-attentive processing refers to cognitive operations that can be performed prior to focusing attention on any particular region of an image. But basically, 
This is the stuff that you notice right away. And our minds are really good at spotting one or two differences when everything else is the same. Like in this example, you can, you can find Waldo. Um, or in this example, um, this, is, this is not hard. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, this is not where Waldo hangs out. Uh, where he goes, I can't find him at a glance, and I need to spend a ton of actual effort. Um, our experiences with Waldo are, are typically something more like this. So some MIT researchers actually studied what happens when people saw a scene like this, and they used eye tracking devices to see how people actually go about finding Waldo. This is what happens when you search for Waldo. And as you can tell, it's not very straightforward. So Waldo kind of thwarts our pre-attentive processing. We can't see him, despite the fact that he's right there in, in plain sight, because he doesn't stand out in any clear way or color or size or orientation. Uh, and obviously, this is for a reason, right? Waldo is purposely hard to find because his surroundings were constructed to hide him. But in general, we don't want our, our graphics or our data visualizations to be this much work to understand. If someone had to search this hard to find the information you were presenting, it would be kind of a bummer. Um, so you, if you want to be clear, avoid this Waldo strategy. Instead, take advantage of these pre-attentive features. Um, here, and maybe you can, I think you can still maybe see it, um, the use of color draws your eyes into specific lines of, uh, of red text. Uh, in this example, the gray lines are government claims about the drone program, and those red lines are official statements that it doesn't exist. So we're using the pre-attentive feature of color to show contradictions. Um, here, it's the use of size used to highlight how much longer movie credits have gotten over the years. So whether it's size or color, contrast, et cetera, um, it helps to have the point you want to get across encoded in one of those pre-attentive features. And you'd be surprised at how many times the most important thing in a data visualization is not the most noticeable. Um, so the, the last two graphics I showed were also um, special members of uh, a category uh, of we things I like to refer to as tiny text. Um, this is exactly what it sounds like. You make the font really small. And tiny words can help call attention to differences over time, um, like this piece, which compares uh, different editions of the origin of species. Uh, or they can help us explore terms used in Hong Kong policy addresses for the last couple years, uh, or see the rise and fall of, of Fortune 500 company rankings. Small things can also help us show a step-by-step -step process. And many examples of this sort of thing involve tiny people, uh, like this, these, these graphics that show figure skating spins, or triple axles and toe loops, or aerial skiing, or snowboarding tricks. And they're not just useful for the Olympics. Uh, so here you see the process of all the planes taking off from an LA airport in a day. Uh, or what happens to wee chickens before they end up at a supermarket near you. Uh, or the phases of the moon. And these process graphics also seem to show up a lot in dance moves. So for those of you who've been waiting to learn Thriller, now's your chance. Uh, or for that matter, any of these other moves. Uh, here's a, an older graphic using little mini feet. And just as we things are useful in dance, they're also used in art. And you, some of you might remember the wonderful Ed Emberley, uh, who taught us to draw silly monsters and animals using some combination of circles and squares and lines. Uh, we've also got process graphics like this one. You've seen many of these today. One of the many steps of creating a Japanese woodblock print, um, or how to make a, an origami elephant. And we things can also be used to, to orient someone, to give them kind of a bird's eye view. And one of my, my favorite features of Sublime Text is this little mini map on the side, which shows you a zoomed out smaller version of, of the page you're working on. Uh, and I have no idea if this was actually the inspiration, but I definitely noticed it uh, when this uh, graphic came out at the, in the Washington Post um, that has a little mini map on the left side of the regular size map that scrolls down as you move along 14th Street. Same idea here, um, where you see where you are on Fielder Avenue as you move horizontally through the photographs of houses. Uh, these were damaged uh, in Hurricane Sandy. And mini maps can also give you more context for a story. Like in this example, where the route of a long dog sled race in Alaska is filled in as you scroll. Here's a, a vertical version of the same thing, following a drive from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Uh, or in this train route along the modern day Silk Road, which is visually tied to corresponding images uh, along the route. Another benefit of we things is that they pack a punch. So a, a tiny graphic can say a hell of a lot without taking up too much room and can convey a lot of extra meaning. So in, in some cases, this happens by swapping tiny things in for words. 
Uh, so the book, The Information, uh, is full of these little inline pictures, um, like little arrows to convey intonations and in speech, uh, or a sequence of little dots to show an early idea for, for Morse code. Uh, Galileo decided to stick tiny pictures of Saturn into his writing and use them as just sort of another part of the sentence. Uh, another old example is this version of Euclid's Elements by mathematician Oliver Byrne, uh, who illustrated the whole thing with geometric shapes right in line with, with the text. <coughs> And we've also got mini graphics that many of you are probably familiar with, spark lines. These are tiny charts that usually show variation uh, over time. Um, now you can even put them in your tweets. Uh, another familiar example, the icon. And we use icons and symbols all the time to convey a lot of pretty crucial information, like what's down the road, or which door to go in, or how to play and pause and, and rewind. And on the web, these are especially prevalent. Um, social navigation icons you see all the time. Uh, and if you think about it, they actually tell you quite a lot about how to find your way around a website, or where to search, or how to like something. Um, the Noun Project is a collection of icons that you can use for free. And there are lots of other sort of free icon sources like this. Uh, graphical fonts are also icons. So here's an example of a font called Stateface, which makes it easy to embed a little wee state into a graphic or, or table. Um, but keep in mind that while some icons carry meaning, um, they don't all carry the same amount. Uh, so icons work because they're recognizable, right? And if, we're, if people aren't quite sure what they mean, then they kind of lose that, that power. And new icons may take some time to become commonplace. So a study of, of search icons found that the lone magnifying glass is often not enough to convey search, especially when it doesn't look exactly like the magnifying glass that we're all used to. Uh, instead, it helps to give people a couple more clues, um, like placing the icon on the top right-hand side of the page, or placing it within something that looks kind of like a, a text field. Um, on a similar note, not everyone knows that the hamburger icon stands for menu, and it's definitely not as universal as, say, a peace sign. Another analysis found that making the icon look more like a button, or actually including the word menu, uh, made people much more likely to actually understand what it meant. So make sure that if your icon is new or unclear, you add some, some extra information. And of course, this doesn't mean that you can't make up your own icons as long as you provide context. So we may never have seen a man riding a fish before, but in this case, it obviously represents a fish hatchery employee. I mean, what, what else could it be? <laughs> and uh, one more benefit of, of we things is that they can help us differentiate uh, individual elements. So you often see these graphics with lots of little small circles, um, and these imply small individual things. And you can easily guess that they are multiple kind of distinct elements. And you might try to hover or click on them. Um, and, but the little dots make it clear that, that these are distinct. Here's another example. So now I'm going to broaden the scope of we things a little bit. Uh, we've been talking a lot about physically small uh, things, small things in space. But there's also a different kind of more abstract idea of we things, and that's small things in time. Uh, the tiny moments, the interactions that we spend very little time on, they might only take like two seconds, um, but can make a really huge difference in our experiences and our, in, in our understanding. So I want to talk about micro interactions. So what are micro interactions? Um, you can think of these as kind of small contained moments. So changing a setting, logging in, favoriting or liking something, giving a rating, importing or exporting or searching or sorting or syncing or formatting or saving, like the list goes, goes on and on. And I'm definitely not the one who came up with this term. Um, there are a couple of great sources on tiny details and micro interactions. And some of the examples um, here I've, I've just stolen from these places. And these interactions might seem trivial at first, like who cares about a hover state on a button or a confirmation box? But I think they are really important. Uh, and the details really do make the design, especially when it comes to, to interaction. So let, let's look at what we things can do to help make our, our interactions better. Uh, one thing they can do is give hints. Uh, and little things can help. Oh, good, you saw that. I was worried it would be too small. Uh, little things can help direct someone's attention to what they're supposed to do, to what will happen once they do it. Uh, OK, OK. Uh, <laughs> or, uh, or I didn't actually make this. Just Google like Waldo and GIF or something. It'll show up. Um, so yeah, so little things can help kind of direct people's attention to what they should be uh, paying attention to. Um, and they can let people know sort of whether or not they actually successfully completed something. Um, 
so keep in mind that, I mean, some hints are better than others, and we can't really say the guy in the red striped shirt and have anybody find Waldo. Um, this is not helpful. Uh, so it's important to kind of give real, real hints. And so hints can take a number of forms. One is by taking advantage of affordances. Um, in the physical realm, this refers to attributes of an object that make it do what it does. Um, a wheel affords rolling, a light switch affords flipping. Uh, in the online world, we depend more on perceived affordances, uh, like buttons that look like buttons, uh, or links that look like links. Uh, and, and a lot of this is just convention, right? Like there's nothing about blue underlined text that means link, but we've just gotten used to that idea. Um, and they've become sort of established over time, and we use them now to give people a clue as to what they can actually do here. Uh, here's an example of a pretty obvious hint. I see a blinking purple circle and think, OK, I, I can click here. Um, but this gives me no clue as to what will happen when I click that arrow. Right? I can guess, but I'm probably better for everyone if I'm not going around the internet clicking on things and guessing at what will happen. Uh, and that's where feed forward comes in. So feed forward is kind of like feedback, but it happens before the action. And it gives me a clue not only of what I can do, but what will happen once I, once I do it. Um, and so, so knowing what will happen before you perform the action. And that means that I can perform that action with confidence. And in here, so you can see that a little black strip on the side of the menu comes out when I hover. And I can guess that when I click on the button, some sort of sidebar or something will come out. Um, and that's, that's exactly what happens. So feed forward is not just that I can click, but also what my clicking will, will actually accomplish. Um, feedback is another kind of hint. Uh, and feedback tells you basically the result of your action, right? So whether it was a, a success or a failure. And this is important. Like, did I sort the thing correctly? Did I select the right state or search for the right term um, or go to the next screen in a sequence? Uh, every action should be acknowledged. And then feedback can sort of turn into another hint as to, to what will happen next. So let's look at some hints in the wild. Um, here are some nice ways of uh, providing feedback, uh, a series of dots along the bottom of the page. These are both actually on your phone. Um, and as you scroll, they highlight. It also hints at the direction um, that, or as you swipe, rather, um, it hints at the direction that you need to swipe like, in order to, to go to the next one. Um, here's another kind of other swiping examples. Um, hints that I uh, need to sort of go right or left. Or the arrow gives me some information. There's also words like swipe to begin or slide or slide to unlock. I, I really wish that people would kind of make up their mind about what's the direction and the word to use. Um, right now, I feel like it can be a little confusing. Um, but another example, uh, a lot of these kind of new fangled article templates these days want us to scroll down. OK, so we often see something like this, a big fat arrow pointing down with the word view. Uh, or here, we've got um, the very bottom, it's a little small. We've got a pair of arrows with the words scroll to read. But somehow, these instructions always remind me of the push-pull signs on a door. Like, <laughs> usually, if it needs a sign, it's not very well designed. Uh, so how do we design interactions that labels and uh, instructions are, are not necessary? And actually, in the case of scrolling on the web or, or swiping on the phone, I think this might be pretty easy. Uh, here's an example of a website that has no arrow or button uh, or scroll or view instruction, yet I immediately know that there's content underneath, right? Because I see a little part of it. Uh, and the website resizes uh, at every window size to always show me this little sliver of, of content. Uh, and I, I think this works actually a lot better than, than having a big arrow. Or on a phone, this can work too. When I go to share an image, um, I get a bunch of icons of, of different possibilities. And uh, there are more to the right. And you might have to kind of look closely. But um, I know instantly, because I can see a little sliver of them. Right? There's no need for a see more label, because I can tell that I'm sort of missing something there. And this is just something to keep in mind. Um, I try to live by this advice from Don Norman in the design of everyday things. If it needs a manual, it's probably a failure. And I don't know if we need to go that far. But typically, the like <clears throat> less manual is, is usually a good thing. Um, something else we things are good at is providing data to you up front instead of uh, making you go out and, and seek it. And this actually takes the need to interact usually right out of the picture. So Chrome shows you a little icon of a speaker. Um, if there's music playing in one of your tabs, you don't have to go and, and click around and find it. Uh, the calendar app shows you the date uh, without you having to open it up and find it. 
Um, the clock app shows you the time. Note that the weather app does not do this uh, for no good reason. And for all the weather app cares, it's always partly cloudy. Uh, and it does not have to be this way. This is another weather app that does exactly what most people use the weather app for. Someone please change this. Uh, speaking of weather, uh, Google also, or Google shows you the wind strength and direction in the size and direction of its arrows. Uh, Chrome shows you all the little instances of a term you search for on the page um, in little tick marks, uh, and that's yeah, bringing the information forward to you. I don't know why we don't see more of this. This website, rather than just telling me office hours, includes what time it is at the office. And this seems really simple, right? Like computers know the time. Um, that saved me the trouble of calculating time zone differences and just tell me what I wanted to find out. Um, often we know we have some context or some information about the people who are coming to our site or users on a phone that we can use to actually make their lives a little bit easier. Uh, two more examples uh, here. The eyedropper shows me the color I've selected. And Amazon shows me the number of items in my cart. In both these cases, information that could have been hidden behind another interaction or, or, or step was brought, was brought to the top. And micro interactions can also help us prevent errors. Um, as an intro to this, let me tell you about my favorite machine in the world, the coffee grinder. So with a coffee grinder, it's literally impossible to hurt yourself because right, it only works when it's closed. This is unlike, say, a blender. And this is really good. Um, you see all sorts of products where this is not the case. And one very painful example is the instant soup cup, which falls over and leads to scalding burns pretty often. This is actually one of my favorite collection of wee things. Uh, it's an actual picture in an actual scientific paper about the angle at which you need to tip the instant soup cup container to make them fall over. <laughs> This, this happens. Science is great. Uh, so why are so many soup containers tall and narrow? Like You'd think they would all be flat and wide if we really want to prevent horrible burns. Um, but this doesn't seem to happen very much. Um, in, uh, in the online realm, I mean, uh, we're not getting as, as dramatic as burning. But um, this means doing like little things that make it impossible for me to screw up. So here, Gmail knows I use the word attached. So it prevents me, or at least gives me a heads up before I send an email without that attachment. Uh, here, I am stopped from accidentally being born in the future by a little warning sign. Um, here's what. <laughs> it's great, right? OK. Uh, here's what not to do. Um, the top says, uh, cancel this payment. And your options are, OK, cancel. <laughs> so. <laughs> So yeah, whatever possible, I mean, prevent mistakes, right? Right. Be clear. And while many we interactions are invisible and we don't even notice them, um, some of the best ones we, we do notice. And they add little moments of surprise. Uh, and these can be cle ooh, sorry, uh, clever little transitions, uh, like this example, where the menu icon transforms into an X to become the close button. I was like so overjoyed when I found this. Uh, or sort of using context to predict what I might be needing right now. So this uh, app called Waze knows the time of my typical routes. Um, and so here is asking me if uh, I'm, I'm driving home because it happens to be 6.30 and I often drive home at that time. Um, so it's able to guess for me. Um, little things that acknowledge that my memory is limited and I forget immediately when I start typing what I was supposed to fill in. So here, the input label um, just moves up to the top, so it's still there. It just moves out of my way. Uh, this can also mean little notes to your users that are funny or have some personality. So if you're uploading something to Dropbox that will take a long time, it tells you to grab a Snickers. Um, if your text gets too long, Google Voice just stops counting the characters entirely and says, really? Uh, the, um, Vimeo cancel dismiss button is labeled I hate change. And all of these things take into account that you're designing for real people who have a sense of humor. And then there are little tiny interactions that are just fun, like shaking your phone and getting a snow globe effect on your photographs, um, or pressing the spinner over and over again to get a new prediction about who will win the Senate. And these are not always explicitly about conveying information, but they're tiny moments that we can make some kind of emotional connection to the user. Uh, and delight is something we might overlook sometimes <laughs> or not bother spending time on. But I think it can really make a difference. Uh, and I think it's worth, uh, whenever possible, to, to try to make those connections uh, and spend some time 
an effort on the details, even if they are very small. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.